you some slides. You don't just have to look at me for, uh, for the next hour and a half. Um, I'm going to be showing you some slides. I'm going to be talking around the slides. I'm just going to read to you what the slides say, but I'll tell you a bit as we go through. Um, I aim to cover things by, by within not much more than, uh, than an hour or so. And then we're booked in for an hour and a half. So then we should have some time for some questions or any comments at the end. If when I'm talking, I say something you have no clue what I'm saying, or it just doesn't make sense, don't understand, then please feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and ask me a question. You're very welcome to do that. Uh, but when we do these online things, it's easier if I go through rather than to keep going back and forth. I've got a couple of things I want to ask you questions so people can unmute themselves if they'd like to answer. But the first thing I'd like to do before we get started um, is to check out what the backgrounds are of the people who are with us uh, this evening. Uh, so far, as I said, around 10 people. So if you're a mental health professional, if you're a, a teacher, a doctor, um, a hypnotherapist, a coach, uh, just interested but don't have a background, please let me know. Because often with illuminations especially, we have a number of people who've done energy healing, or hypnotherapy or other kinds of things. So it's good to know uh, about that. And I have a few slides that are relevant uh, to you in particular. So can I just go through briefly and ask you to let me know what your, just, just very briefly, what your interest is in a CBT, what your professional background is that you might be interested in CBT. So if I can just go through uh, and you can just unmute yourself and just tell me briefly. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Manju. I'm uh, located in UAE, in United Arab Emirates. I work in a school. Uh, I hold the position of counselor. So I do have a background in psychology, but uh, my, my degree is, uh, is old. <laughs> so much is happening and so much is changing that I thought that this would be a good way uh, for me to upgrade myself. And uh, this is probably a good starting point. Uh, that's why I'm here. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much for that. Who'd like to uh, introduce themselves next? Hi, my name is Anupama. Hi there, Zainab. Hi, Anupama. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from Middlesex University, Dubai. And I've graduated with uh, psychology in counseling skills. So I was looking forward to do a CBT training course with your institution, with your wellness center. Sorry. Okay, it's not a very good, uh, not a very good uh, connection that we have. I'm not sure why. Um, so maybe anyone who's not speaking right now can just mute themselves because there's got a bit of feedback coming from a couple of people. I'm not sure who that was. Whether that was Anna Palmer who introduced herself. Um, if you just do a thumbs up, if it was. Um, no, <laughs> so I was saying up. Those icons so you can let me see the thumbs up. Okay. Zainab, okay. okay. Okay, great. It's my Thank time you. or? Yes, uh, go ahead. Here, I am Abdul Karim, and I am from Riyadh. I am uh, qualified as a life coach, also agility, agile coach and uh, trust coach after make some assessments uh, i trust uh, we had to do uh, coach session to the beneficiary uh, and they come to the cognitive uh, coach to get some skills or know some area about coaching and like that thank you Okay, great. Thank you very much. So you have a coaching background. That's good to know. So um, who haven't we heard from? Omar and Anupama and... Um... Yeah, hi. Hi. My name is Anupama and I'm working as an occupational therapist. I have been in the mental health field uh, for the past 10 years. So I would love to get certified in CBT. This is uh, where I uh, thought I would just get registered for myself from. Okay, excellent. Okay, thank you. And uh, Omar, how about you? Hi, um, I don't really have any background. I'm just interested in learning new things. That's it. Great. Okay, well, that's always a great position to start from, one of curiosity and interest. Okay, who's next? 
I've got Manju, I've got uh, Oman, I've got Joe Kenneth and um, Pushparani. Anybody else wants to introduce themselves just briefly? Because I want to get started with the slides. But um, anybody else got anything who's got a relevant background? Okay, so Savio. Okay. Hi, this is Joe Kenneth. Yeah, I'm working at the Biotism Center as a certified RBT, ABE therapist. And I want to just uh, be, uh, and I'm interested actually with the CBT. That's why I joined. Excellent. Okay, great. So you have a, a background in the health uh, professions. And we've got Lamise and we've got Emmanuel, Anna. There's quite a few people hopping on board. So, okay. So I'm going to get started now. If anyone, as I said, has any questions, wants to put anything in the chat box, please feel free. Um, just want to make sure everyone can see the slides okay. And as I said, just a quick reminder, if you keep your audios off so that they're muted, so that we don't get feedback on the call. But if there's anything like you lose me or you don't understand something I'm saying, please put up your, uh, please put up your hand uh, or come on screen and just uh, and let me know or unmute yourself just to tell me. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, scroll up now. So I'm at the top because I can't see everybody all at once now. So this is, as you know, it's a free introductory webinar. So we're going to give an overview this evening of a little bit of background about psychology, the development of psychology, so you understand how CBT sits within that. So that's why we called it incorporating CBT into your practice. That won't be relevant for those of you who are just out of interest and don't work in this field, but it may whet your appetite to do something else and perhaps take some kind of a, a professional practitioner entry level qualification so that you could then think about doing CBT um, or training in CBT because the courses that we run are generally short courses that are intended for people who've got some kind of professional interest or background where it will be relevant and useful for them to learn CBT and to gain a CBT qualification. There's nothing to stop someone coming on the CBT course out of interest but because it is a professional practitioner qualification, uh, they would get a certificate of attendance but they wouldn't get a qualification if they didn't already have some kind of whether it be coaching, whether it be a therapist, an occupational therapist, a hypnotherapist, a, a school counsellor, some of the people we've heard from this evening. So for those people, there is a post-course exam and they can then get a qualification which is UK accredited. So that's the, the context. And uh, the reason it says at the bottom there, positive psychology in action, is because everything that we do, and I'll run through a few of the things that, uh, that I do and that we do at Transformations Institute and that we're working in association with Illuminations, are all about the principles of positive psychology that are then expressed um, and addressed through a number of different kinds of modalities, of which um, I practice quite a few, but there are, there are many, many of them, of course. So um, that's me. And... Um, this is probably the most crowded slide in terms of, uh, of uh, seeing the various different kinds of logos there. That's not all of them by any means. But this is just to let you know that everything that we do that leads to a professional qualification, be it a short intensive professional development course like the CBT one that's going to be coming up later this month and that we've been running with Illuminations over the last few months online, um, through to the longer trainings that we do um, in, in positive psychology using clinical hypnotherapy, psychotherapy and counselling, um, all of these are, have various different levels of accreditation in the UK. Um, there is their NLP, which some of you may know about, and we actually work directly with Richard Bandler, who's the guy who invented uh, NLP in the first place with John Grinder, and so we are, um, we are trainers and coach trainers also for, uh, for Richard Bandler. Um, there are many, many NLP organizations around that we work with Richard directly and all the others apart from this one there you might see the cursor over it that's the Canadian Counselors and Psychotherapists Association so some of the work we do um, is accredited from Canada but mostly the rest of it is uh, apart from NLP which is America all the rest of the and uh, NACBT the National Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapists is American but all the others that you're looking at there are actually British uh, associations that we're accredited with for various courses. So I want to just say to you in terms of they talk nowadays about um, social proof uh, because anyone can claim anything about themselves. Um, so I just wanted you to know that in fact Transformations Institute, although it's uh, been based in Dubai for some time, it was in Bahrain for some time before that, um, 
It's an international um, body and our institute actually is being regarded very highly by our peers. So this isn't just what I'm telling you. And what you can see is there is actually in London outside the Ritz Hotel, which is quite a famous place in London, receiving one of two awards that we've won in the last couple of years. Uh, and those awards are for being the school of the year amongst the, the whole international community of schools that deliver the courses that we do. Uh, so that's based on the excellence. Whoops, sorry. I just need to tell, there's someone else trying to get through on Skype, so I'm just going to tell uh, Phil to um, to ask them to just not ring in because that could mess up our connection here. Excuse me. Phil? Sorry about that interruption. Okay, um, so yes, as I was saying, we've, we've won that award and that's that's basically our peers, the people who run schools around the world doing what we do actually um, assessed us as being the top school for the quality and the quantity of the graduates that we've prepared. So we've actually been quite um, pioneers in this field in the Middle East. Now I want to ask you to reflect on um, what these people do. These are some of the main people who work in the field of what we would call um, mental health side of well-being. We've got psychiatrists, we've got a psychiatric or mental health nurse, we've got a whole range of different kinds of psychologists, uh, clinical, educational, health and organizational. Then we've got psychotherapists, hypnotherapists, counsellor, and of course there are different kinds of counsellors because some have an advisory role because the word Originally, counsellor meant someone who was a wise person who gave good advice. And we've also got what you would call more uh, therapeutic counsellors who work with people like school counsellors, as uh, one of our participants here, sometimes in universities or colleges, um, personal counsellors, etc. Pastoral educators, that might be not a counsellor in a school, but a teacher, but they have a pastoral role, in other words, to take care of the well being of the. Um, Hopefully that will stop in a moment, sorry about that. Um, and we've got social and community workers and we've got coaches of which there are many nowadays. Now I'm going to ask you a question, see if anyone answers that. What's the difference between a psychiatrist at the top of the list there and all the other people that are there? What's the difference between them and all the others? Anyone want to, um, to give me their suggestion? Yes, psychiatrist has a medical degree. So Absolutely. they're able to prescribe medication for certain conditions. That's right. So any doctor can actually prescribe any medication. So as you may know, some of you, um, even just your GP, your general practitioner, or any, any doctor can actually prescribe medication. That is what we would refer to as psychotropic medication, medication that's designed to affect the mental or emotional states. Only a doctor can do that. And of all that list, of course, yes, a a psychiatrist has to be a medical doctor. Many people don't realize that. They think a psychiatrist is sort of like a psychologist, uh, a therapist of some sort. No, they're not. They're a medical doctor who then has specialized in psychiatry, which is essentially not psychotherapy. It's essentially going by a book um, called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It's got different names around the world, which is basically hundreds of different mental health conditions which are voted in by psychiatrists and clinical psychologists as being what we consider to be mental health disorders and as you quite rightly said they prescribe medication and that's mostly what they do unless they are fortunate enough or uh, were determined enough to get training in therapy of some sort uh, so most psychiatrists are not trained as psychotherapists so people don't understand don't realize that and mostly what they prescribe is actually told to them what they should prescribe by the pharmaceutical industry so I'm not you know, so the subject of a whole seminar if you want to get into it but if anyone's interested or uh, thinks really or let's prove that I have I have many years of research in this field so I'd be very happy to send you links and so on but there is a big problem with psychiatry because it treats mental health and emotional health as if it was the same as physical diseases because they're medical doctors. And of course it's not. And if you've heard of the theory of brain chemistry imbalance, or that's why we need medication for depression and all sorts of other things, there is absolutely no empirical evidence that this is the case. We change our brain chemistry all the time by what we think, by what we feel, by what we do, and any medication that you're given is not going to find an answer. 
uh, to that. It may give some temporary relief to some people, but for some people, unfortunately, it will actually make them worse. Um, if you look at the packet inserts that they put into the drugs that are prescribed for people with mental health, uh, consulting because they're depressed, they're upset, they're anxious, they're, uh, they're neurotic about various things, if you look at the list of the potential side effects, as they call them, I just call them effects, um, that includes depression, anxiety, and even increased suicidal ideation. So if you take a medication like Prozac, for example, very, very popular for many years. I discovered when I was a dean at a university in the UK, and we had three student suicides in, uh, well, we had two suicides and one death, let's say, in three weeks. Every single one turned out to be linked to Prozac, um, two because of suicidal ideation and one because of enlarged heart. And actually the research I did at that time showed that young men aged between 18 and 24 are 300 times more likely to commit suicide if they're prescribed what's called an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, than if they weren't given even counselling, anything at all. So this is why I'm I'm very concerned that people know the difference between a medical approach is very different from a therapeutic approach and goes without saying probably that our concern is that people work therapeutically but also they do need to know and we do teach them on our CBT trainings for example uh, what the medical model says about these things so that people then know and can deal with medical professionals and uh, be aware of what the various different views are. So a mental health or psychiatric nurse can't prescribe medication but they can actually give the medication that the doctor has prescribed. And um, a psychologist, again, many people get confused between those two. What's a psychologist? Anyone, anyone, I think one or two of you are already qualified that field. What's a psychologist? What entitles you to call yourself a psychologist? What do you need to have in the way of qualification or training? Someone like to volunteer? No? What about those that you've, I think, Manju, you've done psychology, haven't you, even if it was long, a long time ago? Could you repeat that question? Yes, the question was, in order to be called a psychologist, what do you need to do? What training or qualification do you need to have? I, I think I have to study some college level to be qualified for such well, quality, yeah, I mean, actually, some, some countries, including the UK, psychologist is actually what we call a free word. In other words, the word psychology or psychologist on its own is not legally regulated. But as soon as you put any of those labels with it, like clinical, educational, health or organisational, then it becomes legally regulated. And that means you have to have done a degree in psychology, which is usually three, sometimes four years, and then do at least one, often two years, postgraduate training in that particular field. So it's an academic qualification, but until you do the postgraduate part, it doesn't actually give you any practical skills or training. And many psychologists and, and in these categories you're looking at here actually come to us for training because they say, I've got loads of theory, but I don't have the applied skills to actually sit down. We even had the head of a university of department of psychology uh, came on and did our diploma, not just the CBT, but the whole, um, training with us because she said look I know all about the theory of psychology but I have no clue about sitting down and actually working with people and helping them sort their problems out. Um, a psychotherapist like a hypnotherapist and some kinds of counsellors basically has to train in a particular kind of uh, modality that's to say one of the hundreds of different kinds of approaches that there are and there really are a lot of them. Um, but what we specialize in is in what we call integrative psychotherapy. So that means CBT, it means hypnotherapy. So we're working with the conscious and the unconscious mind. Uh, we bring NLP into it. We bring um, solution focused therapy. So our approach is very practical and very applied. Um, so anyone who does psychotherapy, as I said, you could do a Jungian training and it might take you five years. Uh, you might train with some schools and they take you three years. But the minimum in the UK to call yourself a psychotherapist and be taken seriously and have the opportunity to join one of the registered is a minimum of two years. For hypnotherapy, it's closer to a year. And for counselling, it could be one to two years. And you can 
mostly those courses in the UK and in most of Western Europe, in fact, most of the world, uh, but there are exceptions, those courses are usually taught by um, private institutes like ourselves, uh, because there is no requirement to have a psychology degree first. It's all about applied skills and life skills and life experience. So you could have been a housewife, an administrator, a banker or whatever. But if you've got good empathy skills, if you understand people well, if you communicate well, those are the sorts of things we're looking for when we train people uh, to work as therapists and counsellors. Um, pastoral educator, I already mentioned. I'm just... Uh, Sorry, I'm just uh, inviting people who are coming in, asking for uh, to be allowed into the waiting room. Okay. I'm just admitting them now. I don't know why Illuminations isn't doing it. They're supposed to do that, but anyway, here we are. If you can hear me, Illuminations, can you start letting people in? Because it's very distracting for me to have to keep letting stopping and letting people into the waiting room. Thank you. Okay, um, and then we've got people who do social and, uh, and community work are often trained in applied skills of working with people, practically speaking. And coaches, again, anyone can become a coach and what sort of coach they are and how successful they are will depend on how long they spend uh, training, um, what sort of training they've had. But what I will say is that anyone who works in any of these fields will actually benefit from CBT training. And I know because we've trained people from every one of these fields, including psychiatrists. Um, so it's more about, as I said, personal skills and qualities. And here's the thing, compassion, humility, and the willingness to work with others to empower them. Those are the things we're looking for, rather than do you have a, a textbook knowledge of all the different theories in psychology. So having said that, I'm going to simplify psychology for you now uh, into four main approaches, okay? The first one, there's something wrong. And we call that deficit psychology. And this is very much associated with Freud, who most people have heard of. You know, the idea of the, the glasses and the beard sitting there, listening to people talking and talking for hours and hours, uh, for years and years, and eventually maybe they'll feel better. Um, it's actually fairly discredited the conventional psychoanalytic therapy. And I'll talk to you about that more when we talk about why CBT has been so successful, because mostly people will understand themselves intellectually, what's the matter with them, but they won't have a clue about how to actually deal with that. And I sometimes quote the film director, Woody Allen, you know, who makes the comedy films. And I say, he's been in therapy for probably 50 years or so. And he knows all his problems. He makes very funny films about some of them, being afraid of powerful women, uh, feeling nervous that his sex organs aren't big enough, etc. But he still is neurotic. He still has those issues and problems. And that's one of the problems about only having an intellectual understanding uh, and talking about your problems and repeating the story about your problems. Uh, what I'll also say is that Freud believed really had a very low opinion of the human race. We're all incestuous, uh, cannibalistic, murderous creatures, and we need society to keep us under control. And uh, one of his books is called Society and Its Discontents. And it's all about how we have to be repressed to make us behave. But sometimes we get so repressed, particularly in the sexual area, which was his, uh, his, big, uh, his big focus. <laughs> and the problem is that when Sorry, somebody's trying to, yeah, okay, someone else is trying to get the meeting. Okay, um, the problem is that he thinks that really, or he thought that really you could only just keep talking about it and then eventually understand it. And that's not how it actually works. So the next type of psychology we call behavioral psychology. And that's saying, look, there's something going on. Clearly people work in certain ways. You can influence in certain ways. Um, if you threaten them with punishment, uh, if you give them a reward, then they will respond accordingly. And a lot of the early research in behaviorism was done on things like um, on uh, uh, dogs. Pavlov, you may have heard of Pavlov and his dogs. And we'll, again, we'll just run through those after. Uh, we have people studying mice and rats and pigeons and goodness knows what. And uh, that behavioral psychology has actually evolved quite a bit, which is now we actually use behaviorism, but in a different way, because this kind of uh, behaviorism didn't really think that people had much control. It was all about being stimulated and getting to respond in certain ways. Um, 
we've got there's something right, and that's what we would call humanistic psychology or psychology of being. And this guy, believe it or not, Abram Maslow, you may have seen his pyramid of needs, you know, the organization charts, uh, basic survival needs, working your way up, social needs at the top, self-actualization, actually uh, having individuation, having a personal view, bringing out the best of your potential. And coaching works quite a lot with those principles as well as um, positive psychology. He was the first psychologist who actually said, look, why all the research we're doing is on people who are sick, people who are unwell, who can't cope, who can't function, who are locked up in, uh, you know, in, in, um, in wards where they can't be allowed out. Why don't we study people who are well? Why don't we study healthy people who are functioning well? And then we might be able to understand more about, about how human beings function. So this was the first time we started looking at what's right with people. And then the phase that we're in now, which is why I think it's very exciting, is what we call uh, there's something better. This is now the phase of positive psychology. And again, and many people in this field, but I've mentioned one of the best known, Martin Seligman, and the whole point with positive psychology is to say, look, we agree with all of this, there's something right, but there's also something better. Why don't we study the people who are the really the ones who are the best in their field, the ones who've really broken through the barriers? What makes people happy? What makes people mentally resilient? And so that's why positive psychology can very comfortably work together with CBT. So I'm going to add somebody else I haven't mentioned because I said, I don't, I don't know if we have tonight, nobody said so, but we often have some hypnotherapists in the, um, in the groups. And uh, one of the things about uh, this guy here you're looking at is a psychiatrist, Milton Erickson. Uh, but the difference between, sorry? Did somebody ask me a question? No, okay, I'll continue. So Erickson was a psychiatrist, but he believed that conventional psychiatry was really not, not the way to go forward, uh, treating mental illness as if it was a physical disease. And he started working with what we nowadays call the subconscious or the unconscious level of the mind, because as he quite rightly said, that's the vast majority of how people function is they do things on autopilot automatically. So if we can talk to the subconscious mind, we can actually bring about changes. So he was um, a very famous, very successful clinician. And those of you who studied NLP, which some of you may have done, will know that NLP, um, what we call in hypnotherapy, Ericksonian hypnosis, um, NLP actually calls the Milton model, works with the principles of Milton Erickson, which is the way that you speak to people can actually help you to address their unconscious or subconscious mind directly. Now, CBT doesn't do that. So CBT combines very well with people who do hypnotherapy or NLP, but they, they focused on the subconscious, but they haven't maybe learned a conscious level model of change. NLP, which I've referred to, was based on the work of Virginia Satir, um, who is the mother of modern family therapy, uh, Fritz Perls, who developed something called Gestalt therapy, and Erickson, who I showed you on the previous page. And what NLP sought to do was to bring together linguistics and psychology and looking at how people function in terms of the way that they're programmed and program themselves and that's something else that we teach and i'm not going to talk about it uh, in any any depth now but what i will say is that nlp again goes extremely well with uh, with uh, cbt because cbt uh, does formal questioning what we call socratic questioning which again i'll come to shortly and that fits very well with what we call in nlp the meta model actually looking at how we program ourselves with how we talk to ourselves and how we represent things to ourselves. So to positive psychology, I mentioned Martin Seligman and uh, you can actually, <laughs> if you don't know how to produce Mihail Sixcent Mihail, then you can go on YouTube and there's a video telling you how to pronounce his name. It's one of those Eastern European names that's very difficult uh, to speak if you don't know that language, but they published a manifesto and it was only just over 20 uh, years ago saying they founded what we call formally now the academic study of positive psychology but it's very much action research and they believe that the psychology should now be about positive human functioning which is based on science based on research and effective interventions that will build effective communities and i have to say that the applications of positive psychology 
because it's now being proven by neurology, we've got this wonderful marriage between neuroscience and psychology going on, which is really beneficial. And instead of the old approach, which was, this is the school, I'm, I'm cognitive, I'm behavioral, I'm uh, this, I'm that, I'm the other, I'm Rogerian, I'm something else. Now people are working together to find ways to actually get results more quickly rather than this idea of long months and years of analysis. And I'm also mentioning again, because we often get people who say, I've done energy healing, and uh, what about um, the law of attraction? What about the quantum field and so on? So yes, we're well aware of, and we actually work with Joe Dispenser's, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Joe is very inspirational, Bruce Lipton, you can see there, um, Deepak Chopra, very well known, um, people like Candice Pert. So there are many, many nowadays that take traditional systems of energy, but are now combining them with modern psychology. And so we have things like EFT, emotional freedom techniques, Reiki, uh, theta healing, et cetera, et cetera. So to us, an integrative psychotherapist and counselor, it's useful for them to have a knowledge of those things. And again, they're not in any way in conflict, but they're not the same as CBT. So here are the roots of CBT. It, it goes right back to Greco-Roman times, what we call the inductive or Socratic quote, uh, approach to reasoning. So that means if someone makes a general statement, I'm very unhappy, I'm not a happy person, then we want to start going to chunk down to specifically, what is it you're not happy about? What particularly makes you unhappy? When was the last time you were unhappy? Describe for me a specific time what unhappiness what you thought, what it felt like, etc. So we're looking at getting right down to the specific rather than dealing with generally, I'm depressed, okay? It also um, has a lot of influence from the Stoic philosophy, which fits in with what nowadays we refer to as mind, as um, the uh, philosophy, sorry, of the um, resilience, mental resilience, being stress hardy, being able to cope with stress, and also it's linked to some extent with the old traditional four humors theory of personality medicine. And this tradition of the old style traditional is reflected in the latest variation of CBT, which is called MCBT, which is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And that's based on someone called John uh, Kabat-Zinn. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, if any, uh, but he teaches mindfulness techniques based on Buddhist mindfulness uh, um, meditation techniques. And there is in fact a master's at Oxford University in the UK where this approach is taught. And that approach also has things in common with the last variation I'm going to mention, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. And this came out of work done with uh, CBT, done with people with personal uh, borderline personality disorders, who found it very, very difficult and scary to face rapid change because CBT is all about change and pretty rapid change, although you don't want to push the clients too fast. And DBT said we need to also um, understand the nature of the feelings and the people's fear of actually changing and focus on acceptance. So the dialectic in dialectical behavioral therapy is a balance between acceptance of how you are and who you are and wanting to change that. So, if we go back to the days of the, the Buddha, the um, historical character, the Tama Buddha, um, he didn't leave any writings, but a lot of people wrote about him and wrote down things that he said. And one of the quotes is, what we are, what, sorry, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts, and with our thoughts we make the world. Now, if you think about that quote, um, later I'm gonna show you how that's very much in line with many of the things that are being done now in mindfulness practice and in CBT. So I mentioned this uh, CBT origins on the behavioral side of psychology, but if you go from these early days of what I mentioned before, when we get to Volpe, I never know if it's Volpe or Volpe, um, systematic desensitization. So in the 50s, he started looking at how instead of being like lab rats that were experimented on, could we actually get people to desensitize themselves to things that they were afraid of? And so we started having uh, what's known as desensitization or unlearning fear. And he also developed what we refer to nowadays as assertiveness training. In other words, yeah, we can change our behavior, 
but we can do that ourselves. We don't need to be um, experimented on by an outside agent. We can actually change our behavior, but simply by practicing doing things differently. So you can see why the doing comes under behavior. And if any of you are um, practitioners or know about EFT, um, you'll know the subs of the subscale. It's where you say uh, the subjective units of discomfort or disturbance. And that's where if you say, look, if you've got a scale of one to 10, um, how strong is that pain you're having, that physical pain, or your feeling of anxiety? Uh, where is it on the scale? So you can say, oh, if it's about a seven or an eight, or, oh, no, it's going right up to a 10. So he came up with this idea of getting people to assess for themselves what was the level of pain or anxiety that they were experiencing, um, both physical but also psychological pain. And there have been a whole bunch of people since then researching on this behavioral side of CBT. So now I'm going to just run through the two main figures because most people know about this guy. And we've actually, there's some great videos of Beck working on YouTube and so on. And if I tell you Beck was actually um, <laughs> born in 1921, you can see he's actually 99 and he's still alive and still practicing and researching. Um, and he's still very much with it mentally. Uh, because he's still alive and been around a long time, people tend to think of Beck automatically as CBT. But in fact, the very first person um, in terms of when they were born and who first started developing these ideas, we need to pay a debt of gratitude and appreciation to Albert Ellis, who's known sometimes as the grandfather of CBT. He was a psychologist. Remember that list I showed earlier? So he was a psychologist. He was a radical humanist. And he worked um, with uh, sexologist Alfred Kinsey. He was very much interested in what really went on with people, not just the conventional front that they approached. And he found that psychology um, wasn't enough. So he trained as a psychotherapist, um, but he found that psychotherapy of the sort that I mentioned before, the kind of long-term analytic therapy, didn't help his, his uh, clients get better. So he broke with psychoanalysis and he started developing a new, more active and directive form of therapy where, as it says, the therapist's job is to help the client to understand that their core irrational beliefs lead to emotional pain, what he referred to as catastrophizing. And he came up with a technique uh, which is known as the ABC technique. Now, the interesting thing about these two, and I'll show you them briefly together on the next slide, is that they never met until very late. It was just before Ellis died, in fact. Um, they independently came up with very similar techniques and ideas about how therapy could be effective because they found that the traditional psychotherapy was not effective. Unlike Ellis, who was a psychologist, Beck was a psychiatrist, so he trained as a medical doctor and then psychiatrist. Again, like Ellis, he trained in, uh, psych in uh, psychoanalytic therapy, but he found that it didn't help his clients, particularly he worked with a lot of depressed clients. And so he started uh, developing again, like Ellis is, a more active, interactive form of therapy where the therapist gets far more engaged in helping people to work on their thought patterns and effectively to encourage people to become their own therapists, to understand their own psychological and emotional processes. And he developed a number of them, what we call psychometric instruments for measuring depression, suicidal ideation and so on. And he also pioneered work, which he's still engaged with, in using CBT, well, he, his version of it, which is cognitive therapy, uh, of people who've been labeled as being schizophrenic. And they've actually had some very, very good results for people who are supposedly incurable and have a disease that lasts for life. Now, I said I'd show you them together. They first got together at um, one of these sort of um, an audience with, where a lot of people in the field um, they had a conversation on stage where people could also ask them questions and they could discuss things. And they realized how much they both had in common. They both believed in experimenting, doing practical experimental action research to test their hypotheses. Um, and so cognitive behavioral therapy has got a very good evidence base right from the beginning where they actually do studies to see how people are before and after, what they do, whether it changes them, and it actually does. Um, so, the common features of CBT of both of these gentlemen here was that they focused on the here and now. They took an active and sometimes directive guidance role with the client to get the client to work within a structure and to start working on alleviating symptoms 
and on reducing the vulnerability of the patient to their negative thoughts. And this is basically the model. And it's not rocket science, but it's very, very powerful. Of course, there's a lot more subtle things to it, but basically what CBT consists of is there is a triad, a constant flow between the thoughts that we have, what we think, that affect how we feel, and that also affects how we act. And then of course, there's a feedback loop amongst all of those things. So essentially, if we break it down to its very simplest terms, CBT is about getting a client to actually start noticing and becoming aware of what thoughts they're having, what triggers those thoughts, the situations, um, what they're doing, etc., how that makes them feel, and then starting to understand and analyze their feelings and looking at their behavior and how much their behavior is affected by this, and then starting to experiment with doing things differently, changing a thought, focusing on a different emotion, doing something different to see if that makes a difference too. So it's very practical and the client is extremely active. So it's not one of those therapies where the client comes and says, hey, make me better, fix me please. It's actually one where the client goes out with a bunch of things that they need to do to apply. And of course, how much you get them to do and how quickly will depend on what state they're in when they come to you. Some people you need to go quite gently in the beginning because they've been stuck for a very long time. Other people up straight on with it in a few sessions, they're out the door completely changing their lives around. So everything that goes on in our mind, including in this cognitive behavioral model, our memories, our images, our thoughts and attention. The behavior is everything we do. So it's what we say and how we act and also how we avoid taking action, how we solve problems. And then of course, therapy is a systematic approach to combating a problem, illness, or any irregular condition. So the central concept of CBT is we feel the way that we think and we act accordingly. Now, there's a lot of emphasis in CBT on motivation. So if I give you an example of this, okay, think of the situation we're all in now. Most people have been in lockdown for months. Some people now have a relative amount more freedom to, to move around. Others are still very restricted. Uh, some people are required to wear masks, uh, whether they think that they're healthy or not for them, uh, but it's legally imposed on them. Something will happen to them, they will get fined, they will get in trouble if they don't. And so that is an extrinsic motivation, right? You get punished. So think of carrots and sticks, that's a stick. Now, if you think of that as an operant conditioning process, you're being conditioned to behave a certain way by what's going on in the outside, what might be the carrot? If the stick is, you'll get arrested, you'll get fined, you'll get in prison if you don't do what the government tells you to do. What, what might be the social cognition aspect of that? Why might people comply with what they're told to do? Not because they're afraid of punishment, but because they feel some kind of reward. Anyone like to make a, um, a response to that? What might happen from the outside that might make you want to comply with the law that it is, um, is being imposed on you and that you would be punished if you don't follow. You feel safer? You might feel safer personally, yeah, but what's the social cognition? That I'm um, abiding safe. by the rules. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. That I'm abiding by the rules and the society will see me complying with the government rules. Yeah, but the society in this case, when we come to social, who's that likely to be in practical terms for you? Friends, family, exactly. colleagues. Exactly. So the carrot might be people will think I'm a good person. They'll think I'm a good upstanding member of society. If I am um, in the UK, if you go outside and cheer for the National Health Service at a certain time, um, you comply, you do what... Uh, you're supposed to do, but you celebrate the people, you say, stay at home, keep your mask on, etc. then your friends and society will approve of you, which means that it's quite tough at the moment for those people who actually, uh, I won't say too much about this, I don't want to get in trouble, uh, but if you actually read most of the scientific papers, uh, there's very little that's actually scientifically evidence-based on what we're being required to do. Now, if you're a person who believes that, and you try and say, no, hang on a minute, i I've got to do this because of the rules, but I don't want to do it uh, because I don't think it's effective or, or uh, actually true. A lot of what's being said, it's very misleading, but your family won't like you, your friends won't like you, they'll say you're dangerous, you're a lunatic, you're a conspiracy theorist. Then that means 
that you're not getting the reward. So this is why people like to comply to be accepted. And again, those of you who have been around since the beginning of the talk, remember I talked about Maslow and the pyramid of needs? So society, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be um, not judged by your, your peers, by having your family, your friends, your workmates accept you, that's part of the social cognition that makes us comply with the rules. Now that's the outside. But what CBT says is actually that's only a small part and it's not really the way that we change. The focus in therapy is on intrinsic motivation. So that means, as I was saying before, the thoughts, the affect means one's feelings or emotions and conation is simply again a psychological jargon word that means behavior, what you do, how you act on those thoughts and feelings. You've got your biology, obviously that's going to have some effect on you if you're sick, uh, not well, not well nourished, then you tend not to be in a, a good positive state. There's also spiritual. If a person feels very cynical, they have no, I don't mean religion, but I mean spiritual. You can be religious, that's fine, but people who aren't religious can still have a spiritual um, feeling, and that means something. there's something greater than just me, there's something more. And so if people have those things in place, the intrinsic, as I said, is not just from outside what society expects, but also wanting to please, that's where the overlap is. But generally in therapy, unless there's intrinsic motivation, unless someone has thoughts, feelings, and wants to do things that will make them change, then any change that's imposed on the outside won't work. And if I quote you, for example, you probably know that when the Soviet Union uh, got disbanded, when uh, the USSR uh, fell apart and it just became then um, Russia and each of the countries became independent, does anyone want to guess what one of the first things that got reinstated was that had been banned under the communist period uh, or era? What did people start doing? Praying, maybe. Absolutely. People started going to church. People started having a religion or having a, a religious faith or a spiritual practice of some sort. That had been banned in the communist era. But even if it had been banned for years and years, as soon as people were free to choose, they went back to having that. So what drives us is very much what's going on on the inside of us. So if there's a very strong feeling of something more or a cultural attachment to a religious or a practice or a ritual of some sort, people will do that, even if the law says that they shouldn't. So they might be frightened to do it or do it openly, but once the law is lifted, once the politics changes, then they will do what they are driven to do and feel to do internally. Now, CBT helps us to start looking at what we call the jargon word. I'll tell you any jargon word here. I'll tell you what it means in simple, plain English, because I know not everyone here has the background. So a self schema is what CBT refers to. And that's a package of knowledge about yourself that actually gives you your view of yourself. And we hold self schema for particular, for particular domains that are personally important to us. And we have very can someone um, who's got feedback just put your mic off because it's um it's distracting. We can hear the feedback in the room. Thank you. So people might tell someone might say to themselves, I'm a friendly person and I'm a people person. That's their self-schema, that's their image of themselves. Someone else might say, mm, I don't trust other people and I'm shy. So we organize and direct these images that we have of ourselves, these thoughts about ourselves, into what we call schemata, which is packages of self-knowledge. And when Beck did his research, he found that there was a significant, a very strong correlation between the severity of someone being depressed and the degree of negative self-evaluation and pessimism that they had in their thoughts and their feelings. So there is a strong correlation between a negative view of the future and a negative view of the self. And this supports Beck's view of what we talked about, that cognitive triad. In this case, a depressed person's triad is a negative view of the situation, a negative view of themselves, so low self-esteem, low self-worth, and a negative view of the future. They can't even sometimes think about the future. The best they can think is that it'll be the same as what's happened before. And then the worst is that it's gonna be even worse and just keep getting worse. And yet the future doesn't exist. The future is entirely a concept in our mind. We have no idea what the future actually holds. None of you, or I think very few, maybe some very few psychics 
would have known this time a year ago what would have happened in 2020. So the future we cannot know. So one of the things we challenge in CBT is if someone's basing their behavior and their thoughts on a view of the future, well, that's just made up, that's just non-existent. The past has happened, we can't do anything to change it. So the focus is on, in the present moment, what can you change your thoughts about the situation to? What could you do differently? A negative view of yourself, is that really true? Challenging the negative view of themselves. And as I said, the future, how can you know what will happen? And although Beck said originally this was a correlation, in work that's been done since the 70s, we think now that we've actually got causation. There is no, there seems to be no exception to this rule, that if someone has a negative view of the situation, of themselves or the future, then they are going to continue to recycle being depressed. If you can start to change those cognitions, they will start to change, their mindset will change, and they will start to feel better and start behaving differently. So the goals of CBT are to identify the thoughts and beliefs by self-monitoring and education in order to raise self-awareness and understanding of the relationship between the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. CBT has a big emphasis on self-help tasks. Some people refer to it as homework. I don't like the word homework because people have negative associations with homework and with going to school. But basically, people get given tasks, clients get given tasks to go off and do, so they will maybe keep a log, for example. They might fill in a form or they might do a journal. You know they what CBT is? It's Sorry? cock and ball torture. Sorry? It's cock and ball torture. I'm sorry, I can't tell what you're saying exactly. I'm sorry, if you want to write something in the chat room and I'll, and I'll have a look at it, but I, I don't, I can't quite hear what you're saying, I'm sorry. Okay, so if I can just continue there. So it's about getting people to start becoming aware of when that thought happened. What triggered that thought? Was it a certain situation? Was it a person that you were with? What was the feeling that you had? Not just in general, oh, depressed, but what specifically? Did you feel hurt? Did you feel, um, did you feel unloved, unliked? Did you feel uh, disbelieved, etc.? And what behavior did you take? Did you just shut up and keep quiet or did you get annoyed and upset? So it gets people to start really monitoring what's going on on a day-by-day -day basis so that they can actually really understand themselves. Some people refer to CBT as becoming a detective of yourself, becoming your own therapist. So you start understanding yourself instead of just kind of taking for granted that what goes on between your ears you have no control over. And there is an information processing model in CBT. The stimulus leads to the thought and that leads to the emotion. Now, again, that looks very linear in a diagram, but we're talking about a dynamic system. This is going on moment by moment, day by day. But it's not what we experience, but how we interpret it that determines how we are. And Virginia Satir, who I showed you earlier on, was one of the people who inspired them to develop NLP. Virginia Satir was very fond of saying, Life is what it is, it's how we cope with it that counts. So there are many things that are outside our control, like the situation going on now in the world the last few months, but how we cope with that, how we deal with that, whether we become stir crazy, uh, become suicidal, um, start beating up on our children or our, our uh, spouses, or we stay calm, we focus on things that we enjoy doing, we do the five daily habits of the happiness advantage, which is uh, something that we introduce from positive psychology uh, into CBT. And so the thoughts mediate between the uh, stimuli, the external events going on, and the emotions. So any stimulus elicits a thought, and that might be an evaluative judgment of some kind, which then gives rise to the emotion. So it's not the stimulus which elicits the emotion, but our evaluation of that. Now I'm going to give you a practical example in case that sounds a bit technical. If you walk into a room and out of the corner of your eye, your peripheral vision, which picks things up before you consciously realize it, your eyes and your peripheral vision become aware that there's a coil of something in the corner. And immediately your subconscious mind, all of this is done in a fraction of a second, goes into your emotional alert database in your brain and that's stored in the the lizard part of the brain, the protective stress, uh, flight or fight response, 
part and it goes, it matches it up and it goes snake. And so then you have a thought snake and you're flooded with an emotion of probably fear, unless you're someone from a society or culture which isn't bothered by snakes, in which case you might go and turn around to go and chop its head off or something. But most people would feel a rush of adrenaline and, and get afraid if they thought there was a snake there. But then you look and you see, actually, that wasn't a snake at all. It was a coil of rope. And that coil of rope just out of the corner of your eye looked like a snake. Now, immediately, you know it's not a snake, but if your emotional database has activated the stress response and you become flooded with adrenaline, even though consciously you know it's not a snake, your emotions will tend to start going into what we call a refractory period. You'll still be on the edge of getting anxious or nervous. So if somebody practices being like that on a day-by-day -day basis and things make them feel very nervous, even if they're not really a threat, they start to automatically develop behaviors that will trigger this. So we need to get to the bottom of what are the triggers. Does, I hope that makes sense to you. If anyone uh, doesn't make sense to you, please ask. Okay, so again, there's gonna be time for questions and answers at the end, so um, I'll just continue. Um, CBT changes on focusing negative thoughts. It doesn't say every negative thought is bad. It may be that something is a risk to you, but it does a risk assessment. Clients are encouraged to notice and record their emotional states and triggers and to do things like, as I said, fill in forms or a journal to start noticing, was that really rational? Was that a logical thought or was it just based on a fear where I've got no evidence for it at all? And so when we come to changing basic cognitions, if we've got cognitions, that's to say thoughts and this thought, feeling, action cycle, which is making us unhappy, then we need to challenge that and do something about it, or we just stay stuck in the same old, same old conditioning. So here's a thought, I'll never have a good job. Now immediately, that's mind reading, isn't it? That's future prediction, that's being a uh, you know, gazing into a crystal ball. How do you know if you'll never have a good job or not? But if you keep telling yourself that you'll never have a good job, then that leads you to feel hopeless. And when you feel hopeless, that has an effect on your physiology, on your posture, on how you communicate with others. And guess what? You don't get that job. You might not even bother to put the CV or the application in. And when you go to the interview, you've already decided you're not going to get it. So you're going to come across as very, very uh, low energy and not at all charismatic and not someone other people would want to employ. We have another one here. Nobody likes me. That's part of their schemata. Remember their package of self-knowledge. So if you feel people don't like you, nobody likes you in fact, or nobody loves you, then that leads to a feeling of being lonely and rejected. When you feel lonely and rejected, what happens? You try to avoid social situations. You don't talk to people that you don't know. You put yourself down. You don't even bother to dress up and go out or join social events. So then you're in, again, one of those cycles, one of those self-fulfilling prophecy loops. On the other hand, you're facing a problem, but you tell yourself, I have solved problems before, then that leads to a state of hopefulness. In other words, a positive feeling. And uh, I often think of it like, um, it's about conditioning yourself to be like one of those weeble dolls, you know, you push them over and they bounce back up again. So that's what we're doing with CBT is helping people to become more resilient and to actually test out their thoughts. If their thoughts are based on fact and logic and reason, fine, keep that thought. But if their thoughts are based on fear, anxiety, on projecting into the future, on constantly ruminating over the past, then we need to get them into the here and now, which is why, again, as I was saying earlier, a lot of the more modern CBT is now introducing mindfulness practices so that people start to become aware of what's going on in that very present moment, listening to their breathing, taking control of their breathing, practicing relaxation techniques, etc. So, what does CBT therapy do? And if you're a CBT therapist and you only practice CBT, you're looking at between probably 15 and 21 hour sessions. If you do longer sessions, maybe a few less. If you're a CBT practitioner who uses other modalities as well, you may well do faster. And Dr. David Cato, um, whose courses we run under license, he's based in the UK, 
Um, he typically sees clients, or he's retired now, he, he only sees very few people, but in, in the days he was running his very busy and very successful practice within a national health service uh, medical practice, he was running his therapy practice within that, um, he would typically see clients for five to six sessions. So that means in only one to two months, a complete change and turnaround and a lasting change. So using a series of behavioral techniques in the first phase of CBT, we're doing things to actually induce the relaxation response, which some people call hypnosis or self-hypnosis. Daily activity schedules so that you change the things you do, because some of you may know already that one of the definitions of madness is that you do the same thing you've always done and expect to get different results. So you start doing things differently. You focus on doing things that make you feel good, and other things you focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. You rate pleasure. So you use that subs meter to say, which things do I enjoy? Which things do I not enjoy so much? And this isn't so much about what other people ask you to do or what's required of you at work. This is your own internal messages that you give to yourself. And the experiments can include controlled exposure. So that doesn't mean throwing someone in and saying swim or sink but it means gradually starting to introduce them fact, uh, to the fact that actually if you go to the maximum, if you go up to a 10 on the stress response, you can't sustain that. It's impossible. Physiologically, you can't keep doing it. So after a bit, that response starts to ease up. So control exposure means gradually introducing things that you can then start to kind of get used to, and after a bit, they don't bother you. It's changing your learned responses. The second stage of CBT is to change the program. Identifying and challenging these negative automatic thoughts that you've just handed over to your subconscious mind and it just does it for you, so you not need to start intervening and thinking differently. Analyze the errors in the logic, particularly that people who are depressed or very anxious tend to make, and you use what I referred to before as this Socratic or inductive questioning, the guided discovery, to challenge and rewrite these thoughts in a more balanced way. So not, it's not affirmations like I'm perfect all of the time, but you know things like, okay, every time I go out and socialize, I find it easier to mix with people. So you gradually start to change your way of relating. So it usually takes about five sessions minimum. Remember, this is only using CBT. It can be faster if you, um, if you use it with other modalities combined, which I'll talk about after. So about five sessions minimum to learn to identify and challenge these negative automatic thoughts and the things that trigger them. And then the final stage, also the client starts questioning, as I've mentioned, what was going through my mind just before I started to feel this way. And the therapist and the client together draw up a list of the key presenting problems and thinking errors. And then the client starts reality testing those thinking errors as hypotheses rather than saying they're facts. Is it really true? Is this really proven? If I'm scared of flying, okay. How safe is it really? How many accidents are there? And if you have a client who has fear of flying, and I've had a lot of those, and particularly in Bahrain, it was uh, interesting because it was an island and it was the only way to, to travel off Bahrain. Uh, mostly what would happen is that they would realize that actually flying is one of the safest ways to travel that there is. And so the fact that they'd seen a, a crash or there'd been some disaster, statistically, they had more chance of actually falling over and breaking their leg when they were putting their trousers on or off a ladder, or um, if you're in Dubai, uh, having an accident in the Sheikh Zayed Road. What alternative ways of thinking then start to be substituted for the original automatic thoughts that are more balanced and reflect the client's experience more accurately. And in the final stage, we can then work with the deeper core beliefs and the unconscious mind. And this is where if you have got someone who uh, practices hypnotherapy as well, that can make that much faster because hypnotherapy can actually very quickly get the subconscious mind to bring forward material uh, that's buried from the past and clear that up uh, very quickly. The negative automatic thoughts are plausible. They're generated around specific themes. Like I'm, these are typical core negative beliefs. I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. I'm never going to change. 
So we get the clients to capture those so they can, they can uh, record them on a dictaphone. Most people now on their phones can do that. But something I prefer to encourage people to do is to write them down. Because when you write something down, you actually use a different part of your brain than you do to run fear, emotion, negative thoughts. So actually, when you start to write something down, you immediately start engaging your more logical, rational brain. Now, I wanted to say something about CBT and research. I mentioned this earlier. So CBT and the, the treatment of depression has statistically proven to change brain chemistry without medication. And in the UK and in most parts of the world, I'm from the UK originally, although I've been in the Middle East many, many years, uh, but within the National Health Service and the private sector, it's the go-to therapy that most uh, doctors and uh, referring practitioners will be comfortable with referring to because it is very, very uh, empirically based. Beck and his followers naturally obviously endorse his approach, the cognitive therapy approach, which has been demonstrated over in, on the, over 400 clinical trials to be effective. Uh, including more extreme conditions such as personality disorders, so-called, um, and in randomized controlled trials, peer-reviewed research, it's been found that it is effective both with uh, bipolar and uh, borderline personality, schizophrenia, etc., sometimes in combination with medication and sometimes not. And I've given a reference there if anyone's interested in looking at more of the research. Um, for the hypnotherapists out there, if there are any, uh, I'll give you a, an example from combining them together shortly. Some examples. In Toronto, they did a study of cognitive therapy as opposed to pharmacotherapy, that's medication, and utilized pre- and post-treatment brain scans. In other words, they scanned the brain before and after. And what they found was there was a change in the brain functioning with both the CBT and the medicine, but the difference was that in CBT, the changes were top down and for the drugs, the changes were bottom up. In other words, antidepressants actually work on the primitive lizard brain, on the, on the reptilian brain, on the, the part of the brain with the amygdala that produces the fear response and the anger responses. So the antidepressants affect that part of the brain and they dampen the activity in the limbic system. But conversely, CBT calms activity in the cortex up here, the frontal lobes, the seat of reason. So for that reason, and that is why the brain changes long term with the CBT and the CT because you're actually changing it with conscious thoughts that you're having. So pharmacotherapy doesn't change the brain permanently, whereas the cognitive therapy does. And so there's much less likelihood of relapse if someone has gone through a process of CBT. So Beck says, I don't want to overstep the data, but it does seem that cognitive therapy does seem to be a cure sometimes. It is a lasting, whereas if you take people off the medication, they haven't actually changed their mindset, their way of doing things, thinking about things. You haven't actually addressed the symptoms. You've just put a Band-Aid over them for a while. And as I said earlier, sometimes you've made them worse by doing that. So evidence-based research shows that CBT works. It helps the client to become their own therapist, to understand their own thoughts and feelings and behavior. And one of the great things about it, because it's flexible, is that you can incorporate CBT with other modalities. I said I'd mention hypnotherapy because uh, usually when we do something with illuminations, there are people there who studied hypnotherapy. Uh, some are in training, some have already uh, are trained. So I just wanna briefly talk about um, the similarities and any differences. They're both structured and focused and relatively short. CBT in its own, as I mentioned, could be 15 to 20 sessions. Hypnotherapy or between one and eight and 15 sessions, usually between about three and eight, depending on how severe the condition is, what number of problems that somebody's got, etc. But generally, it's, it is definitely a problem um, solving and solution focused therapy, as is CBT. CBT uses specific assessment and diagnostic instruments to focus on measurement. Hypnotherapy doesn't tend to do that. Um, again, some hypnotherapists might. Most hypnotherapists will use some kind of initial questionnaire, um, find out things, use questioning, uh, have what they call a pre-talk, and that will vary depending on how they've been trained. Both identify the core negative beliefs using conscious processes in CBT case, using inductive questioning, in hypnotherapy, 
it's done by addressing the subconscious mind directly. So you can see those two are complementary. They're different, but they are complementary. CBT uses reframing using conscious awareness to assess those core realities and negative, sorry, those core negative thoughts against the actual reality. Hypnotherapy tends to do it using what we call parts therapy. But ideally in hypnotherapy, you're seeking to get um, a unity, a partnership going between the conscious and the subconscious mind to focus on one idea, one new change at a time. Also, CBT focuses on specific negative thoughts and seeks to challenge those and replace them with positive thoughts, and hypnotherapy does exactly the same thing. CBT sets a series of structured goals for change. Hypnotherapy sets goals for change, and depending on the therapist and how they've been trained, they may be structured. Some are more loose and some are more structured. CBT requires the client to do work and actions between the sessions, uh, what I've referred to as homework or self-help tasks. And this reinforces new behavior over time and controlled exposure. Now, in psychology, we say it takes about 21 repetitions to build a self simple habit. So if you do these things over a matter of a couple of months or two, you're going to find that those changes will happen. Behavior modification will occur. Some hypnotherapists do set homework tasks and use reinforcement audios and suggestions. Some don't. Some rely on just having a um, session with the client. I think more and more hypnotherapists nowadays are actually uh, giving work and, and actions for the client to do between sessions. Certainly we train people to do that. One uses suds and shifts measures. Hypnotherapy may do, but it doesn't have to. The big difference here, CBT does not focus on the past. It doesn't conduct regression or focus on the past or trauma in the past. It focuses on the here and now and the future. Whereas hypnotherapy does conduct um, regression and analytic work, including parts therapy, to clear any repressed or uh, material or trauma that hasn't come into the conscious mind. So again, that's a difference, but it's also where the two together can work extremely well together. So just to complete on that one, both are active, directive. Hypnosis can be, it's sometimes not so much so. They're both time limited and, and both have some degree of structure, a lot of structure in CBT. Both are problem solving and solution focused approaches and the research that's been conducted to date, we could do with a lot more, but there has been quite a bit already. And you can see I've quoted from one there um, from the um, evidence-based mental health. When adding hypnosis to cognitive behavioral therapy, there has been an improvement in a number of acute stress disorders. I've also seen research on things like um, um, stress-related alopecia, when someone's hair starts falling out, they lose hair because of stress. A whole bunch of uh, different research has been done and they found that hypnotherapy on its own or CBT on their own got good results, but when they combined the two, they actually got the best results of all. So the addition of hypnosis substantially enhances treatment outcomes in CBT, so I encourage people to conduct further research. So CBT is flexible, as I said, it will, it will deal with a maladaptive, rigid cognitions. It's based on individual needs, so it is client-centered, and we only teach client-centered forms of therapy. We don't teach the forms of therapy where an analyst looks at a person and starts interpreting them and telling them what they feel and who they are and, and all of that. We don't do that. We encourage the client to be self-empowered to become their own therapist. And these are just some of the things, uh, I'm not going to read them all out, but what I will say is um, that one of the things we'll be looking at in, for those of you who are wanting professional development, we are running a, a two-day uh, freestanding module on sex, sexuality and sexual difficulties, which includes a number of things, including CBT. And then at the bottom two, eating disorders, OCD and many other issues, we actually have a follow-up course for those who want to get an extra diploma, not just the diploma in CBT and with the psychology of depression and grieving and loss, but also a diploma in eating disorders and OCD, which is based on CBT, but also incorporates some other techniques, including some hypnotherapy techniques. So the last slide from me, um, so I'm well within my time here, which is great, is going to be held in the last two weekends of August. Um, this is through Illuminations, as I mentioned, and I believe, that, I don't know how many people, they've got a few people registered already, but if there are still places in that first six participants to register, we'll get a 10% discount. Now, this course is not intended for complete beginners. 
as I said, if someone's interested and done some reading and so on, I and um, we'd, we'd have to have a chat. But I would accept them on the course for self-development, but not they wouldn't be able to take the exam after the course. That would require them to have at least some relevant background to be able to get the diploma in CBT. Um, it's issued as an accredited course that's accredited in the UK, and it's uh, for those who say I'm not ready for this or I need uh, an entry level training first. Then that stage, from our point of view, would be the two year integrative uh, international diploma in integrative psychotherapy and counselling, which will include uh, training in CBT and in hypnotherapy and in energy psychology and an, um, the foundation level of NLP. So that is a two year course to lead to a British accredited, UK accredited um, qualification in psychotherapy and counselling. So that's all the slides that I wanted to show you to give you an overview on the roots of CBT, where it comes from, where it sits in the um, in the different areas of deficit psychology versus uh, humanistic psychology with behavioral psychology and positive psychology, and also what the model looks like. In the actual training, the two intensive days, as you can see, from 10 till 6 each day for two weekends, in that we cover in detail the theory and the practical work. We go through case studies and prepare people so that they can take the exam. And I can tell you, personally, I can tell you, I was a bit nervous about what the results would be by doing this all online, because previously we've done face-to-face uh, -face or some online and, and the rest face-to-face, -face. but we've had to do everything online since, um, since the end of March. And I can tell you that every single person who submitted for the exam has passed the exam, and a number of them with extremely good results and have now got their diplomas. Um, all in the diploma in CBT and uh, about probably about half or more, maybe two thirds, have also done the OCD and eating disorders um, course, which is a two day one, and they've got their exams and their extra diploma from that. So anybody got any questions, want to ask about anything that I've mentioned or anything I haven't mentioned, uh, anything you would like to know, it's over to you, please ask, please go ahead. Right, so Manju Segal, so if you can uh, ask me a question, Manju. You will need to unmute yourself, Manju, to... Um, you'll need to unmute yourself, Manju, if you want to ask me the question. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, sorry, I wasn't able to unmute earlier. I, I'm just curious, we spoke about motivation earlier. I work with a lot of uh, young students and uh, I've, I think you said that it has to be intrinsic. But uh, so I have tried, uh, you know, very often I'm told by the teachers uh, because I'm in a school that you need to give them a pep talk, give them a motivational talk. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's not been very productive so far. No, Those who are no. really motivated, well, this but is how because do I go yeah. about them? I totally understand. And I worked in, I mean, I've zigzagged between therapy and education. I've been an educator for many years. I've taught in, in school, not for a long, long time, but in colleges, universities, I've been a university dean. So you don't, you know, total, totally empathize with you on that one. Yeah. The thing is, the skill in it is finding out what it is that a young person wants to get out of it. Even if we acknowledge there are things about school they don't like, they may never like, they may just go and forget about it at the moment they've left school, but what is in it for them that will motivate them to go ahead and do it? And the sensible schools, we've got quite a few of our graduates now, many of whom are, are actually parents themselves, who've gone into their kids' schools, some have become uh, school counsellors as well, and they've run mindfulness programmes, um, the lady who's the head of psychology at Repton School is one of our graduates, a psychology head of department, and they've been running mindfulness courses, well-being uh, courses and so on. And you know what? The kids absolutely love them. They want more of them. A number of their IB students said this should be in the school curriculum right from the get-go. Not just send them for a pep talk to the school counsellor, but how yeah. do we actually get students to reflect on critical thinking skills? to have emotional intelligence. How will this benefit them in life in general? Because just doing a blah, 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 blah is one in one ear and out the other. We all know this, right? We need to be motivated by something that turns us on. So the use of things like 
This is why I said I'm, I'm an eclectic integrative therapist. I'm a CBT practitioner. I'm very skilled with CBT and I train people in it, yes, but I use NLP. I use visualization techniques. When I teach CBT, people get, um, they don't get the whole thing, obviously, but they'll get enough of that that they can use because visualizing what you do want, visualizing a new blueprint for how you want to be, how do you aim at something if you don't know what that thing is that you're aiming at? So you can get all that you need to do this to do better, but who for? For your parents? For the school teachers? For the school itself? No, people want to be motivated by something that is in it for them. So what's in it for me? Yeah? So, you know, you can talk to kids, especially teens, in terms of, okay, how much energy is it going into arguing with mom and dad? How might you have a better relationship? How could the emotional bank account be built up with mom and dad? Or with your teacher so that actually instead of reacting um, you use behavioral techniques like from assertiveness to say okay use a fogging technique that's to say agree with everything you hear that's true in what's said to you but just ignore the other stuff so um, you know mum says tidy up your room okay if I knew why it was important to you for me to tidy up my room if it was really important to functioning or hygiene then maybe I'll be able to do it can you please give me a reason rather than oh leave me alone so the same thing goes in school you know and the more that kids get turned off you probably know maths is one of yeah. the subjects that's constantly we're being told is taught badly why because it assumes that everyone thinks the same some people think in pictures some people think Auditorily, some people think kinesthetically, and that's just the NLP bit of it. You know, Howard Gardner talks about the seven or eight different intelligences. So if education is only focused on people who are auditory or visual, then guess what? They have trouble taking the information in. So okay. it's, it's not a question of just using words like a pep talk. It's getting motivation. And the other thing I would say, although this is about CBT, I would say that the people who are best at CBT have a lot of NLP skills as well. Because if you use language to say something like, and imagine as if you were in a situation where, could you imagine that there was someone in this situation where they had this uh, experience and what would you say to them? What would you say to them if it was them? If you were to tell a story to that person, what story might you tell? See, it's all permissive language. You might, it could be, it would be somebody else. You're not saying do this, do that. Because as yeah. soon as you do that, about a third of the population are going to rebel, aren't they? The nomadic, independent, I like to do my own thing, the warrior types that are, don't tell me what to do, that's two thirds of the population left. But you've only got about a third of the easygoing settler types who are going to comply yeah. and you know go along with it. And they'll be going along with it because they don't want you disapproving of them, but secretly they'll be doing completely different things. They'll just be lying to you and getting good at lying. And, you know, uh, we're also, <laughs> I'm trained with uh, Dr. Paul Ekman, who's the godfather of um, emotional intelligence, and his books on lying and truth and lies are considered to be very sexy, you know, the lie to me programs and the inside out emotional intelligence. But, you know, he did a study on um, why kids lie. Okay. And he did a study on these schools in the same African country, and they were near each other with the same conditions, same cultures and everything, and then he looked at the school's values. And in one school, lying and telling lies was not a very big deal. It was more important that you did well, were, had a good sense of community, etc., etc. The other school, the main focus was on being truthful and honest and never told lies. And in the research they did, you know what they found? Who were the really good liars? Can you guess? The one the which emphasized on uh, truthfulness. Yes, exactly. When they didn't want to tell the truth and then it was a high value, they got to be really good at lying. They got to be really good at giving the indication through verbal and, uh, and body language cues so that people believe them. So you actually teach people to be good liars by punishing them and being really heavy about telling lies. If you're easygoing and, well, as long as it's not about anything life-threatening or crucial, it's not a big deal. Tell a story if you want to. I'm more concerned that you're kind, uh, that you're compassionate, that you are uh, are happy, that you're true to yourself, those are most important to me, then the kids don't feel the need to lie. So it's really interesting. And, and those of you who are educators or um, parents in the, um, in the group this evening, um, do have a look also at uh, Professor Carol Dweck. Uh, she's a researcher who's done some great work. Hers is, if you've heard of the growth mindset or growth, fixed and growth mindset, that's come from her research. 
And she found again, when kids are given feedback that's vague and general, even positive feedback, like you're so smart, uh, you're so clever, etc., it actually puts them under stress because they fear they're not gonna do so well in, in the tests or whatever the next time. If you say, that's, that's good, and if you've actually done this, that could have improved it even more. Yeah, I like the way you colored that in this bit, bit. So you give them good, you give them positive feedback, but you give them critical, constructive criticism as well. They like it. They love it. They, they thrive. They want to do better. They want to do more. So she's a, a very good one to look on that. And she's also done a very nice YouTube video. I think it might be a TED talk called How I Cured Myself of Perfectionism. And this is a psychology... Oh very distinguished psychology professor saying, you know, perfectionism actually is really destructive to the human psyche. It stops people being creative. It stops them trying things out, experimenting, because they might get it wrong and fail, and then they'll be in trouble. And if I ran a school, if I ran a school, and I, I have someone whose mother-in-law owns a school, she's gone back to Pakistan where they have a school there, and she's working as the school counselor. They wanted her to run the school. She said, no, I'd rather be the counselor. I said to her, if I run a school, one of the precepts in that school would be the NLP presupposition, there is no such thing as failure, only feedback. Because yeah. if you have been, if you behave when you were learning to talk and to walk, and by the way, those are the two most difficult things we ever have to learn to do. We've done them by the time we're about three or four, right? We're walking yeah. by the time we're one to two, and we're talking by the time we're about three to four. And, and so we mastered incredibly difficult things at that stage, everything else is really easy. But imagine a baby gets up and it's gradually practicing and eventually it gets the confidence, takes that first step and then falls over. If it behaved the way that we treat kids in school and this failure thing, they would just go, that's it, I'm never gonna walk. I just can't do it and I'm just gonna stay here. But they keep getting up and they keep practicing and they fall and they get up again. That's called feedback. You learn by doing and by not getting the result you want and then you try again and do it differently we should cultivate the experimental attitude in kids and say that's interesting feedback what did you learn from that not you failed and write red lines all over their work so i think unfortunately i think primary education is often better but then as soon as they get into secondary education suddenly they we want to turn them into robots and how many of the skills do you actually use that you learn in school out in real real life world you know look at all these entrepreneurs who never graduated college or in some cases didn't even get any exams because they were dyslexic or whatever so i'm not knocking the idea of having good education but what i'm saying is a lot of education it's not education it's programming and so i think uh, and that's a long answer to your question but i think you just start Thank getting you. skillful at how you respond to your your uh, your masters at the school and they tell you pep yeah. talk them and get the kids enjoying being with you and, and doing mindfulness practices or whatever it is they do have fun because fun having fun humor turns on the learning centers in the brain so we remember things if someone tells us a risky joke there's something to do with sex or something naughty or something we shouldn't do it we remember it immediately <laughs> someone goes blah 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 that's why I translated any of the jargon words for you in my in my talk because jargon just switches people off. So I hope yeah. that helps, Manju. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Okay. I have another question. Go ahead. Uh, in in hypnotherapy, Unless anyone else wants to butt in. Have, have, have your go, and then if anyone else wants to come in, they can jump yeah. in. Go ahead. I just wonder, is it dangerous when you talk about hypnotherapy? I mean, you know, dwelling into your past and those thoughts and all, is it harmful? Yeah, if, if things are in, if it's, if I think of this like, okay, if you had, a, um, you had a storage cupboard, a pantry, and you have things in there that are going off, that have gone off somewhat, what do you do? You go in, you clean out, you take out the moldy stuff, the stuff that's gone rotten, and you chuck it out and clean it up, and then you can use it. If you leave it and pretend it's not there, um, you hold your nose when you go past, you look away, eventually you've got mold or you start getting cockroaches or it's there anyway so there's no danger in just clearing up the past if there's something in the past to be dealt with as i said cbt doesn't focus on the past but yeah we have, we have found in the profession that um i've had a lot of cbt therapists come to me to study hypnotherapy as well because they'll say i can do certain amount at the conscious level and then we seem to hit a block and what that is is the subconscious is basically lock the door on something and you know what? As soon as someone even just says something about a fear or anxiety, even if they just remember something they buried away, 
is a huge sense of relief because it takes so much energy to suppress things you don't want to think about, you don't want to remember. And of course, the more you tell yourself, I mustn't think about whatever it is, then you just keep going back and thinking about it. So no, there's no danger at all. Remember when we call it hypnotherapy, that was a word invented in the, in the 19th century. And it's a bit unfortunate because what we're talking about is the relaxation response that a cat puts themselves into by purring, you know, that it's natural, babies do it. You just go into this deep relaxed state. And when you're an adult, you can do that and keep your conscious mind just in the background and then focus. And it's what good creators do, inventors do, artists do, people who have the ability to tune into their creative processes. You're not actually asleep. It just looks as if you are. You're fully awake, but you're in a relaxed state. So you don't really feel like doing anything. And in that state is when you can bypass the picky part of the conscious mind that goes, what about this? What about that? Is that true? Is it not? And you can just allow the subconscious mind to listen to suggestions and to take on board ideas. The reason we use it is simple. The subconscious is running about 95 to 99% of your brain. And if you don't address things that are going on in there, that's only 1% to 5% that's working with you. This is why I like to use CBT as the clarification, because also you need your conscious mind on side. If you try to change someone's unconscious and it's against what they believe or their values, it, it, it will just not be received or they might just say, oh, this is ridiculous, I don't want to do this. But okay. as long as they consciously want that change, then the subconscious mind will let that change happen, but only if it's relaxed and feels safe. So this is why you need to be in that state where your endorphins are going. Uh, you know, as soon as you're in stress, you can't go into a relaxed state and therefore you can't learn properly. And also, by the way, um, and this is a whole topic in itself, but the stress response is what is is responsible for most of the illness in the world in, in the modern world because it switches off the immune system it slows down the, the uh, gastric system it switches off the sex centers basically anything that's not essential to your survival is bypassed or switched off or turned right down when you're attempting to fly away uh, and escape even though you don't let yourself that's what your primitive brain is telling you to do so that's what causes people to get sick and as soon as they learn how to relax, how to manage their thoughts and feelings, and to feel comfortable in their own skin, you can do absolute wonders with people who just, you know, literally, even a few weeks ago, they were feeling suicidal, they were in a state of just shaking, and, uh, you know, and sometimes I send people to have physical therapy, things like um, TRE, uh, the trauma release exercises, sometimes some physical bioenergetic work can be very useful for releasing trauma okay. as well. And as I said, I think at the early part of this, um, this evening, I said, well, the great thing is now psychology is teaming up with neurology to understand why it is that, for example, certain kinds of eye movement will actually help you to integrate memory and trauma. Um, why it is that certain exercise will actually not only release uh, endorphins, having pumped you up with the adrenaline and then the endorphin release, it will also teach your subconscious mind that you mean business you're in charge of your body. So the, the five daily habits that I refer to, I'm a great fan of Sean Acor, who's again, one of the gurus in positive psychology, because if you follow his habits every day, you just naturally become more positive, healthier, happier. And as he says, what needs to come first is being happy. And then the success comes from that. People spend their lives trying to be successful so they can be happy and it works the other way around. They're completely mistaken. Okay. In their, in their approach. So thanks for two great questions, Thank Manju. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions? They, they may be great or they may not be, but I'm happy to take them if you have any. And just look, I can't see any in the, um, in the chat window. I'll just check. Oops, I've got a few coming up in the chat window. Uh, okay, so. Uh, yes. yes, good evening. Good evening, Ms. Edwards. This is Savi Travasso. I'm from Goa. I, I, I really uh, appreciate your time and your effort that you've taken for presenting the, the therapies that you spoke about and uh, cognitive behavior therapy. And it's more related to the REBT, you know, rational emotive behavior therapy. No, it's, it's, it's a combination of both because Ellis Actually, contributed things and so did Beck. It's just most people have heard of Beck because he's still alive. I was saying earlier, I don't know if you were here uh, at the yeah, beginning, but I was saying he's 99 and he's still practicing. 
uh, but actually REBT and CBT, why we call them CBT is because if you look at things like the ADC model, uh, vertical descent techniques and so on, they're pretty much the same for both. So mm -hmm. some people have a preference for one more than for the other, uh, but the same principles are involved in both of them. And the people, as I said, DBT, uh, dialectical behavior therapy, the mindfulness space, people are bringing their own things into it. But CBT is flexible enough that once you've got the basic structure, you can incorporate other things as well. So yes, it's a, it's, it's a, a technique that's designed, I think, to be used in combination with other things. So obviously Beck prefers, uh, he, he's, um, he's promoting his own work naturally, it's a cognitive therapy, but REBT, as I said, mindfulness, CBT, and, uh, and, um, and uh, dialectical, I have no, I have no issue with any of them. I think they all do a great job, and they've all got good things in them. Right. Thank you for your uh, for your comment. You. I'm, I'm quite interested. I'm quite interested in the neuro linguistic program. I would uh, really appreciate if you could let me know if there is anyone in, uh, particularly in Goa, who can come and train us out. You know. Well, we can come and train you in Goa if you want to. Just let us know when and when the flights are possible <laughs> possible to do. Uh, Phil, who's not on this evening with me, but Phil, both of us are trainers in NLP. Uh, but Phil, because of the, the workload we have, Phil tells, tends to deliver most of the, C, uh, the NLP practitioner and master pra practitioner and also the coaching and the NLP Society of NLP licensed coach courses. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, put, you know, let, let me have your contact details and... Uh, mm. Uh, perhaps put them in the chat room and uh, and I can follow up with you. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, yes, there are many people delivering NLP, but what I would say to you is check out whether they're working directly with Richard Bandler and whether he personally signs their certificates because there are so many other NLP organizations out there. And right. I'm not saying, and some may be doing a great job, but there are a number I've seen and, and people who've trained here in Dubai and they, they don't even know what the correct presuppositions are. People have you know changed it, they've done their own thing with it. And Phil and myself, our principle is, if someone's alive who developed a system and is still teaching it, we go to the source. If they've died, we say, who's the next one down the line that trained with them? So we try to keep it you know, with the original, that's, that's our yes. principle. So uh, yeah, as I said, please, please get in touch. I've spent time in Kerala, but I've never been to Goa, so I would welcome oh, you. I look forward to see you here. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm just, <laughs> excuse me, I'm just looking down the, um, the list of questions. Someone says, CBT certificate is for people with work previous experience or anyone with a medical degree or without experience. Um, if you look, you'll see on the illuminations, um, uh, if you look at the illuminations page for the CBT course, you will see Anybody who's got any kind of relevant experience, it's not rigid. You don't have to have a medical degree. No, you don't have to be a, um, a psychotherapist, but you do need some kind of work working with people. And if you're in any doubt, then please ask um, Illuminations to put you in touch with me and you can arrange a Zoom chat with me uh, and I can have just a quick chat of sort of 15 minutes so I can just find out from you what your experience is and then I'll tell you if it's suitable for you or not. Okay. Um, so, um, for newbie training, NLP training, no. Uh, to Emmanuel Charles, who's asked, for newbie NLP training must be done before CBT training. No, you don't have to train in NLP at all. You can take CBT on its own. If you are an NLPer, then you can go on and take CBT. If you're a CBTer, you can go on and take NLP. So the two are complementary, but they are not mutually required, okay? Uh, and then Lamise has asked, he's already asked me about that, any good institution for NLP. I'd say Society of NLP, which is run by the guy who invented it in the first place, uh, Dr. Richard Bandler. Um, and since he, it was John Grinder and Richard Bandler to start with, and John Grinder and he parted ways a long time ago, and Richard runs the Society of NLP. Uh, anyone else who's not approved by Richard uh, is doing their own thing, but they're not doing Richard Bandler's original NLP, what he calls pure uh, or classic code NLP. Um, Okay, so I don't know if there's anybody else here got any questions. That seems to be most of them. Oh, hang on. Uh, oh, there's some higher up here. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. Ah, Savio Tarasso asked about, said he'd done his postgrad diploma in guidance and counselling, currently practicing as a counsellor. Yes, then it would be entirely suitable for you to do the CBT course. Uh, yeah, psychiatrists can strive medications. We covered that. Okay, so we had, ah, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy and not 
the kind of torture that you're referring to. Uh, absolutely nothing to do with CBT, um, right? So I hope you're clear about that. Um, it's like NLP. If you look up NLP online, you'll find it also stands for natural language processing, which is a form of computer language coding. Uh, so sometimes initials get mixed up with each other. Uh, but I can assure you that CBT is, as I'm teaching it, is not what you have written down in the chat room. Okay, there's a lot of information there, probably more information than I need. I'm aware of the things you're talking about, especially when we teach the sex module. However, uh, Lamise has asked, if I may ask, how can I benefit from CBT myself? From actually consulting a CBT practitioner um, and learning how to apply CBT to yourself. If you can't afford to see a practitioner, there is a very good book called CBT for Dummies. And depending on your reason for wanting to learn CBT for yourself, there's also one called, uh, that's called um, Depression and Anxiety, and there's a Depression and Anxiety workbook as well. So there's a series published by a publisher called Wiley, which is very good. Obviously, most people prefer to see an individual because that is a lot easier than working with a book, but you can get some good books on CBT. And I think I've covered. Um, I think I've covered everything. Oh, someone's asked: Will CBT? How will CBT help patients going through COVID experience? Oh, anything at all where you're upset, where you're sick, where you're distressed, isn't it good to be able to change your mindset, to be able to reframe? I mean, I discovered our flight had been cancelled for the fourth time. We've been stuck in Dubai since March. We were supposed to leave to go to Morocco, where we have a centre, and I was stressed. And I was on the verge of tears when I realized that there was, uh, they changed the rules about visas, the fill, et cetera. What did I do? I went and I had a swim and I just did a self affirmation, um, what we call an auto suggestion to myself as I swam around and I changed my state and I came back resilient and calm. So I practice what I preach. And that's why I say, how do you, how do, you do that? Someone else has said, um, well, we thank you very much for interested in NLP in case of course for that. Yes, as I said, we, we can offer those. Um, Illumination is also of the NLP, but it's not, it's not, it's not Richard Bandler's NLP. Um, who's the diploma accredited by, someone's asked. The diploma is accredited by a number of different bodies. Um, the ACHE, the Association for Continued Hypnotherapy Education, is where it originally started with David Cato, who's one of, one of the leading what we call CBT uh, hypno CBT, sometimes it's called cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy. And David ran a very successful uh, practice and the Bristol Depression Clinic within the NHS. And it's also accredited by the uh, Open College in the UK. And it's also accredited by the Association for Professional Hypnosis and Psychotherapy and several others, which I can't remember right at the top of my head. But anyway, um, it's, it's got a number of accreditations and it counts for. Uh, for what we call continuing education units or continuing professional development. If you're already a counsellor or a psychotherapist and you need to, or a coach and you need to have a certain number of hours you do each year, then it will count towards the hours uh, for that. So um, that's the answer to that question. If you have any more questions specifically about it, uh, then uh, if it's Ethan or Ethan, but please. Uh, ask illuminations to put you in touch with me because we've got a little while until the course starts so i can answer questions with people if they contact me uh, beforehand to um to let them know uh, more about the course if they need to know but if again if you look on the illuminations website you'll see there's quite a detailed list of the curriculum of what we cover on the course so all of that will be covered you also get access to live recording of the online sessions and you also get copies of all the slides we use and there's a substantial manual well, it's actually two manuals in one one on the cbt or the basics of cbt and the other on the psychology of depression grieving and loss um so that's it's a it's a you know it's a dual accreditation in cbt with the psychology of depression grieving and loss and as i said there is an extra diploma but that is a separate course a two-day course i think i've answered all the questions now and uh, i think we're a little bit over our time now um, so unless there's anything pressing, um, I'm going to say good night to you all and say thank you very much for attending. And thank you, uh, thank, thank you for your questions. Good and day, I hope you found it useful. And do, you know, keep in touch. We'll be doing more webinars from time to time and uh, hopefully other courses in the future too. So bye-bye for now. Keep safe, keep well and keep happy. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.